Hello and welcome to the course Introduction to Advanced Cognitive Processes. I am Ark Verma from IIT Kanpur and we have been talking about language and uh, various aspects related to language comprehension, production. Last few lectures we were talking about various aspects of reading. Uh, in the last lecture, if I remember correctly, we were also talking about a uh, disordered uh, aspect of uh, reading which was referred to as dyslexia and we kind of saw that what kind of patterns lead to various uh, you know uh, kinds of reading difficulties and then there were types of dyslexia uh, we talked about. Today's lecture, I thought I will talk about the disorder of speech production. The disorder of speech production is commonly referred to as aphasia. However, aphasia is not really a singular disorder. There are various kinds of aphasia and there are various aspects of the process of speech production that when damaged lead to different uh, profiles of aphasia. In today's lecture, we will talk about some of the foundational issues of aphasia and uh, some of the basic aspects of how the models of speech production and perception evolved together to lead to different, uh, you know, to lead to an explanation of different kinds of aphasias that were possible. Again, I am not really going to in, into a lot of detail of these processes, but just to give you a flavor of how speech disorders or language disorders kind of uh, play out, I will talk about uh, different categories of aphasia. Now, I have told this earlier as well and uh, let me repeat this today as well. One of the very nicest ways to basically look into the workings of the brain is when you can actually look into the disordered brain, when you can look into the damaged brain, because this is where uh, it tells you that you know which aspects of the brain, which parts of the brain are related to what kind of cognitive processes and you can deduce more clearly the link between the specific brain areas and uh, particular cognitive functions. Now, this damage or uh, these disorders of the brain can be ac both acquired or developmental. Uh, acquired damage to the brain basically could occur because of uh, a tumor, a stroke or say for example, an infectious disease or sometimes a direct injury to the brain. On the other hand, developmental disorders such as autism or specific language impairments are basically coming to the fore when the brain is affected during its developmental phases. For example, prenatally or due to genetic uh, defects or due to exposure to certain kind of harmful chemicals. Now, the extent and impact of these brain disorders is very helpful in demonstrating the important aspects related to localization of brain function. In today's lecture, we will talk about aspects which lead to particular profiles of uh, production, uh, uh, particular profiles of difficulty in uh, production of speech. Let us take an example which kind of made this link possible and is probably one of the most cited example in uh, whole of neuropsychology. In 1860s, neurologist Paul Broca comes across a patient, an adult Frenchman uh, who has a disorder of expressive, expressive dis disorder of speech production and he could not really produce any intelligible speech. He could not say anything rather than he could just produce words like tan, tan, tan and he could not say anything else or some uh, swear words, etc. After Tan died, a post-mortem was conducted and it was found that he has a very specific lesion in the, in the uh, posterior third of the inferior frontal gyrus. This area was linked with his uh, speech production difficulties and came to be known as Broca's area. The disorder of speech production basically associated with lesion to this area later came to be known as Broca's aphasia. Broca's aphasia is probably the most uh, uh, cited aphasia profile and it is uh, something that uh, is uh, seen more often than other uh, profiles of aphasia. Typical characteristics of Broca's aphasia included halting, non-fluent speech and with uh, the speech would have many grammatical errors. It was initially attributed to the loss of motor memories for uh, speech and nowadays it is linked with difficulties in planning and control of speech acts as well. So, this is one of the examples how uh, you know damage to the particular aspect of the brain can lead to particular kinds of disorders. This is uh, an example uh, a diagram borrowed from David Groom's book on uh, introduction to cognitive psychology and here you can see that the Broca's area is basically just uh, to the front of the brain and it is very uh, close to the motor cortices, the primary motor cortices and is inferior to the supplementary motor area. This area is supposed to be involved in uh, planning and uh, execution of speech acts and hence it is one of the more impo most important areas which are responsible for production of speech. In the following days, another physician 
Karl Wernick in 1881 uh, started describing patients who came with disorders of speech comprehension. These patients were basically referred to as having receptive or sensory aphasia. Now, Wernick found out that these patients who are coming with a sudden onset of speech comprehension difficulties had damage to the left superior temporal gyrus and this deficit then uh, came to be known as Wernick's aphasia. This area, the left uh, superior temporal gyrus came to be known broadly as the Wernick's area. Here is the diagram again uh, borrowed from David Groom's book just for an illustration. You can see that Wernick's area is on the superior part of the superior temporal gyrus and it is on the left hemisphere. So, superior temporal gyrus in that sense is connected to comprehension of language and it kind of uh, you know further experiments have uh, and uh, later research has kind of uh, built this link even stronger. Now, on the basis of whatever experiments and uh, the different kinds of profiles that Wernick and Brokaw's and other uh, Broca and other people were coming across, Wernick developed a model of speech perception and production. It was one of the first unified models of production and perception of speech. He proposed initially that because there were two different profiles of the way language could be affected by brain disorders or this uh, split uh, could basically indicate uh, that there are underlying differences in which the perception and production of brain is uh, perception and production of language is organized in the brain. Here is uh, the diagram which is the simplest model uh, which was initially proposed by Wernick in 1881. You can see that on the left hand side there is a speech phonetic movement programs they are connected to the phonological lexicon and then the speech uh, phonetic movement programs are connected to the motor systems and that is the motor cortex and that leads to speech output while the phonological lexicon basically re is receiving input from auditory analysis and that is what is basically analyzing that and probably is helping in comprehension of speech. So, this is again one of the very simplest models of uh, perception and production of speech obviously it had to be developed further. So, Lichtheim uh, started testing Wernick's model and he identified a very important problem. He said that the model could not really uh, account for patients who were uh, coming with the this disorder that then termed transcortical sensory aphasia. So, the uh, problem with these patients was that they had uh, problems in understanding speech and they had problems in uh, producing speech, but they could repeat whatever was said to them rather accurately. Now, Lichtim proposed that you know if we add an additional semantic and conceptual module to the Wernix model, uh, this would be able to account for these kind of patients. So, this particular model which was given by uh, Lichtim. Uh, was referred to as one of the first cognitive models uh, which basically was based on uh, an information processing uh, framework. So, Lichtheim's model uh, basically it has a motor uh, you know it has an output motor module denoted by D, it has an input store uh, of uh, lexical uh, phonological and lexical information which is B and it also has a conceptual center. Here you can see uh, the model that was pro uh, proposed by Lichtheim. Uh, we will probably refer to uh, it later as a Wernick Lichtheim model because this is in a sense a further development of the model that was proposed by Wernick. So, you can see in addition to the speech phonetic movement programs which is in D and the phonological lexicon which is in B, there is another area called the semantic conceptual area which is denoted by F. Now, you can see that there are connections, there are uh, lines connecting the semantic conceptual area with the speech phonetic movement programs and the semantic conceptual area with the phonological lexicon. And then you have the uh, motor uh, systems at the uh, uh, left side and you have the auditory analysis on the right side. Now, uh, this model is uh, specified uh, such as uh, lesions to uh, different uh, aspects of the module, different parts of the module or lesions which could affect the connections between these different aspects of the model could lead to different profiles of uh, aphasia. It, it started explaining the kind of patients that were coming in at that point in time. For example, if somebody came uh, with uh, you know if somebody came with a, a complaint of Broca's aphasia you could uh, assume or you could presume that the damage was to the uh, section D which is the uh, speech phonetic uh, uh, which is the speech uh, phonetic module. And then uh, if somebody would come with damage uh, to the somebody would come with the Wernick's aphasia then you could assume that there is damage to the phonological lexicon. Also if uh, your damage was there between the connection between B and D e, which is basically your uh, line C then people would come up uh, with uh, complaints of uh, they will have damage of uh, speech production and comprehension, but repetition will be all right. So, they will have basically uh, what is known as conduction aphasia. 
in conduction aphasia, damage to the connection between B and D would lead to a problem in connecting sounds to speech output. And basically, the affected individuals would uh, be able to produce speech, but they will not be able to repeat words. This is the model. Now, the development of both of these models actually led to an, a classification system for aphasia. It is also referred to as one of the classical aphasia systems. This was basically a, a system that would describe different kinds of aphasia profiles and would also specify the damage to the aspect of the model which would have led to such a profile. So, I will just briefly go over this. So, Broca's aphasia, uh, you will find that the speech is very effortful, it is laborious, the grammar is incorrect. And this is basically caused by lesion to D, which is the speech phonetic movement programs. Wernick's aphasia basically happens due to damage to uh, aspect of the module B, and which is basically the phonological input lexicon. And here you uh, will see that the patients have impaired speech comprehension. In conduction aphasia, patient will be able to understand speech and produce speech accurately, but they have difficulties with repetition. This will have been caused by damage to line C connecting the modules B and D. Similarly, global aphasic patients can neither understand nor produce a speech correctly and this should have been caused by an extensive damage to both modules B and D of the model. Then is transcortical sensory aphasia. Transcortical sensory aphasic patients cannot understand speech, but they can, pres uh, but they can repeat back whatever is said to them. These patients often show the symptom called echolalia that is obligatory repetition of heard, uh, heard words. So, if you tell them something, they will uh, repeat it again and again. This would have been caused by the damage uh, between uh, the pathways connecting B and F which is the phonological input lexicon and the conceptual center and which is basically denoted by line C in the model. You can see it here. Similarly, there is isolation uh, aphasia or transcortical uh, motor aphasia. Uh, transcortical motor aphasia basically uh, patients would uh, not be able to understand heard speech and they cannot produce speech, but they can still repeat words. This uh, uh, profile of aphasia will be caused by when there will be a disconnect from the concept center to the audio verbal center and the expressive center. The disconnections of line E between B and F and line G between F and D, you can see it here. So, we are talking about disconnection of uh, line G which is semantic conceptual and speech phonetic movement program and line E which is semantic conceptual and phonological lexicon. A different kind of aphasia would be anomic aphasia. Patients suffering from anomic aphasia would have a problem in uh, naming objects across modalities. Say for example, even if you show them a picture of a cow, they will not be able to name the cow. Even if you, uh, you know, make them hear to the sound of cow's voice, they will not be able to name the uh, cow. Now, this would basically be caused by a lesion involving the pathways which connect the uh, concept center to the expressive C, uh, speech center. So, basically uh, we are talking about the line G which is basically connecting the semantic conceptual area to the speech phonetic movement programs area. So, this is uh, basically uh, some of the aspects of uh, what the Boston aphasia classification system gives us and it is a good link. It was uh, obviously it is uh, something that was developed to diagnose these different kinds of uh, aphasic profiles that were coming in. Now, even these models basically the one proposed by Wernick and then the uh, and then improved later by lick time known as the Wernick lick time model, it had some problem. In this model if you notice the anomic and transcortical motor aphasics or the isolation aphasics are basically uh, being caused by very similar damage in the model. But when you look at the patients and uh, when the clinicians were looking at these patients, they found that these two profiles are clinically very distinct. Patients were showing very different symptoms. So, to actually account for the same, to make the model explain these kind of profiles, Kasmol in 1877 hypothesized that there should be a feedback connection from the semantic conceptual area back to the phonological input lexicon. And evidence for the fact that these connections are there came from Feinberg and colleagues study where they showed that people with conduction aphasia were able to tell whether or not pictures of uh, words were pronounced in the same way even though they were not being able to produce the words correctly. So, they would know how these words are pronounced, but they will not be able to execute them correctly. And the presence of these reciprocal connections between the acoustic phonetic input and the semantic conceptual store and then their subsequent disruption could actually uh, account for such a profile of uh, transcortical motor physics. Further, the support for these uh, reciprocal connections between the semantic conceptual area and the phonological lexicon also came when a patient was discovered who had transcortical sensory aphasia. That is, uh, these people had impaired speech comprehension, 
but intact uh, repetition and production of speech. So you can see that the model uh, basically now uh, comes from being called as the wernick lick time model to the wernick lick time kussmaul model. And you will see that uh, there are these uh, feedback connections from the semantic conceptual area to the phonological lexicon, while they have omitted the connection between the speech phonetic movement program area to the semantic conceptual area. We will see that this kind of uh, led to a bit of a problem later. Now, basically to uh, account for a different uh, you know kind of uh, uh, deficit there has to be you know the, this uh, link was uh, envisaged between the semantic conceptual uh, representations and the speech output systems as uh, was there in the wernick lick time model now if you have this link because this the absence of this link was uh, leading to problems now with the presence of this link the model could now explain the profiles of transcortical motor aphasia where patients could understand speech but they would have difficulties in production retention of the link between this conceptual pro, uh, area in the conceptual representation and the speech phonetic mo motor planning would also be able to account for the patients who had difficulty in activating the semantic conceptual models of what they wanted to say and uh, this basically this uh, sp very specific uh, profile of aphasia is, uh, was referred to as a dynamic aphasia at some point now you see also there was this uh, another profile that this particular kussmaul wernick lick time model could not explain was this uh, aspect with deep dysphasics now deep dysphasics basically are patients that can make uh, speech production mistakes but their speech production mistakes basically have a lot of phonetic errors also deep dysphasic patients when they make errors while repeating but these errors are semantic in nature these errors are basically suppose for example if you are talking about uh, you know if you ask these people to repeat a word duck again and again the conduction of physics might actually uh, commit errors of the kind that they will produce duff instead of duck but the transcor but the deep dysphasics would actually produce a semantic relative of duck rather than duck itself so they would probably uh, you know they would basically produce goose when you ask them to repeat duck also when asked to repeat non words these deep dysphasic patients would produce real words that are phonetically similar to target real words so they they have this impairment of repeating non words while the original wernick lick time model could actually explain uh, these kind of profiles as there was a connection between the semantic conceptual area and the speech movement program area uh, the kussmaul wernick lick time model basically could not do it as it was proposed so heilman in 2006 uh, pre uh, basically uh, suggested that the kussmaul uh, wernick lick time model needs to split the phonological output lexicon and the phonological input lexicon so if you remember there is this uh, module b uh, here which is the phonological uh, lexicon heilman in 2006 suggested that in order to uh, be able to explain the profile of deep dysphysics and conduction of physics they need to split uh, this phonological uh, lexicon into uh, two parts into the phonological input lexicon and the phonological output lexicon let us see how this model looks once uh, this is there so this is how the model started looking now so you have the semantic conceptual area the link between the semantic conceptual area and the speech phonetic area is also retained and the phonological lexicon is now split into the so phonological input lexicon and the phonological output lexicon now the inclusion of these separate phonological input and output lexicon provided a way to discriminate between the profiles of uh, profile seen in the problems of uh, people who had deep dysphasia in conduction aphasia people have a so this is how the difference was made uh, in conduction aphasia people would have a potential lesion of the line e which connects the phonological output lexicon to the speech output center you can see here i'm talking about the line e which is connecting phonological output lexicon to the speech phonetic movement programs and this would basically lead to errors in speech production and uh, uh, having problems with repetition when you talk about deep dysphasic patients a lesion of the connections uh, be between the phonological input and output lexicons can be envisaged so you see uh, there is this line c which is connecting the phonological input and output lexicon now damage to this line c basically would not really pre uh, prevent repetition as the input and output lexicons are connected via the uh, semantic uh, store but it would lead to a different kind of a profile as the semantic conceptual uh, uh, root is based on real words non word repetition will become difficult as actually happens in deep dysphasics 
also as the semantic conceptual system does not really have access to phonology uh, the uh, frequent semantic errors will be made uh, as in speech production but because the words selected are uh, constrained by semantics and not by phonetic representation so there will be less phonetic errors when repetition is uh, asked for but there will be more semantic errors when repetition is asked for so this is basically uh, this was how these models were developed and uh, this was uh, the most uh, recent model uh, given by Heilman and uh, this is uh, basically one of the models which kind of explains most of the profiles of aphasia that uh, can be observed. Now uh, I just wanted to give you a brief uh, review into the different kinds of aphasias and their uh, uh, symptoms also uh, just a hint about what kind of lesions they might be arising out of. So the first and the most important Broca's aphasia it is characterized by highly non-fluent speech with difficulties in repetition. Speech is characterized by typically long pauses between words and is very effortful and often you will see that these, parent, uh, these patients will, uh, will basically experience a motor uh, speech problem planning with uh, you know planning of speech acts or dysarthria accompanying this. Patients also sometimes can experience muscle weakness in the right side of the body because see the left uh, Broca's area is in the inferior frontal cortex which is very adjacent to the motor area and because the left side of the brain uh, controls the right side of the body uh, that is one of the reasons why uh, sometimes Broca's aphasics could feel muscle weakness in the right part of the body or even paralysis of the right part of the body. The next profile is of Wernicke's aphasia. Wernicke's aphasia is a disorder of language comprehension. It is characterized by poor naming and repetition. Uh, speech output on the other hand is fluent and they could also be sometimes you know paraphasias uh, when people are you know uh, speaking in jumbled words everything is getting mixed up in everything and also neologisms that they are forming new words which are not there uh, previously. Uh, also, uh, some of these patients uh, suffering from Wernicke's aphasia uh, could uh, show aspects of cortical blindness, things like hemianopia, you know, when there is visual neglect of one side of the, uh, you know, one side of the visual field. Wernicke's aphasia uh, has been linked to uh, the posterior superior temporal uh, sulcus. Uh, then there is conduction aphasia. Conduction aphasia is basically a problem with repetition, with relatively preserved comprehension and uh, spontaneous speech. Although the repetition might be fraught with phonemic errors and also there is problem with confrontation naming. When you show them pictures and you ask them to uh, name these pictures then you will see that these patients will have certain problems. Then there is uh, global aphasia. Global aphasia. In global aphasia all the major functions of language comprehension and production are affected and it is basically uh, coming as a result of extensive left hemisphere lesions uh, involving both the Broca's and the Wernicke's areas. Then there is dysarthria. Dysarthria basically is an acquired disorder of speech production and it basically refers to the uh, difficulty in implementation of speech plans uh, as they are applied to uh, the movement of speech muscles. It is a very specific problem uh, with moving uh, you know the articulators that is I was talking about the vocal tract when we were talking about speech production. So in dysarthria basically the, there is a problem between moving and manipulating these uh, articulators which leads to slurred or mumbled speech. We are talking about transcortical motor aphasia, transcortical motor aphasia uh, patients uh, basically can repeat properly but uh, comprehension and uh, you know uh, spontaneous speech production are compromised. The repetitions are often mandatory in this case so patients uh, display what is called echolalia that they kind of you know keep repeating whatever is uh, said to them or whatever they overhear. It has been linked to lesions uh, with uh, on the anterior and superior of Broca's area. Then there is a transcortical sensory aphasia which is basically linked to impaired comprehension but the preservation of uh, speech uh, repetition and fluent output is there. This could be because of lesions to the medial inferior frontal in, inferior uh, ventral temporal lobe and the anterior superior temporal gyrus. Then there is the mixed uh, transcortical aphasia or also referred to as the uh, isolation aphasia. Uh, comprehension and spontaneous speech are compromised uh, but repetition is uh, preserved and there is no voluntary language use in patients who are suffering from mixed transcortical aphasia. Mixed transcortical aphasia has been linked to uh, lesions to the uh, left motor and sensory cortices and also lesions to the parietal lobe. Then you have the anomic aphasia. Anomic aphasia is linked to word finding difficulties, naming problems and it often leads to vague and imprecise speech this has been linked to damage to temporoparietal areas. 
Finally, we will talk about speech apraxia. Speech apraxia is basically again a disorder of the motor control of speech. People with speech apraxia have a great difficulty in saying what they want to say because they cannot plan their speech and they cannot execute their speech. And this is one of the reasons they are very inconsistent in speech. A word may be correctly pronounced sometimes, but the next time they cannot really you know, execute the movement associated with production of that kind of word. So this is all from me on aphasias. I have not really gone into a lot of detail of it, but I have just tried to give you a flavor of problems associated with language production.